Together, they bring decades of experience in wildlife conservation, ecology, and botany. So first off, we have Pete Ewens. He's WWF Canada's lead species specialist. So during more than his 20 years with World Wildlife Fund, Pete has led conservation programs for wildlife in the Arctic. And now he focuses on ecological restoration in urban settings, where he helps Canadians connect more with nature and to restore habitats in their own neighborhoods. So Pete, I have a question for you. Um, what do polar bears and pollinators have in common? Hey, Pete, are you on the line? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Pete. Yes, although there is one bumblebee species in the range of the polar bear, amazingly, um, the main thing that bumblebees and other pollinators and polar bears have in common is they are both significantly uh, pressurized by rapid climate change in different ways, but uh, that rate of change is unprecedented in the evolution of any of those pollinators uh, and polar bears. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, our next expert we have on the panel today is Ryan Godfrey. He is WWF Canada's resident botanist, and he um, has come from us from past experience working at the ROM and the Royal Botanical Gardens. So everybody just give a warm welcome to Ryan. Um, and as our botanist, can you tell us what your favorite plant is? Oh, Emily. So hard to choose. Um, just want to say hi to everyone. 232 people. Amazing. Love it. Um, okay, well, if I have to choose, um, what the plant that I'm holding in that photo there is a, um, a locally sourced white oak, which is a strong candidate. But I, I think I have to say wild columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. It's got to be my, my absolute favorite. It's coming up in my balcony container garden outside and uh, maybe two or three weeks away from flowering. So very much looking forward to that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. And lastly, we have with us on the line, Ben Porchuk. He's an ecologist at Carolinian Canada, and he has more than 25 years of experience. So an interesting fact about Ben is that he has a native plant garden in London, Ontario, that has more than 200 species of native plants. Um, so Ben, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your garden? Sure. Thanks, Emily. It's got um, prairie, wetland, and forest habitats. It's an older neighborhood. And I would say the one thing that stands out is after 10 years uh, to see the wildlife from insects and birds and reptiles and amphibians return without even helping them has been really encouraging. And this is something that everybody will see from the point that you start with a single native plant. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to you, Pete. Okay, thank you, Emily. You're going to be advancing the slides, right? I sure am. So we'll have the next slide. Welcome, everybody. This system allows us to see how many people are online, and I should uh, wait for Emily to advance to the next slide. Okay, so as my good colleagues said, this is all about uh, restoring wildlife in the proximity of where we live. And that doesn't matter where you live in Canada. This restoration, putting back the plants, habitats, and the animals that evolved here over 10 to 20,000 years since the ice cap retreated, that is the context for us. And that's the kind of scene you get within hours of these flowers blooming. Next. So across southern Canada, where most Canadians live, of course, there are seven terrestrial eco zones, as they're called, zones where the plants and animals and the weather conditions are somewhat similar year round. And uh, it doesn't actually matter where you are there because there are native plants and animals adapted to each of those zones. In our case, we're here in the orange zone, the Great Lakes, um, St. Lawrence mixed wood plains forest. And we'll hear about that a little bit later because we've piloted this program here to bring us to this point. And we know that it's applicable across other urban and peri-urban areas across Canada. Next slide. 
So we're narrowing in now. This is what's called the Carolinian zone. It's actually an eco-region between about Toronto and Windsor, Detroit. And it's where uh, many of these species that occur in the Carolinas actually down to the US. This is their, or has been their northern fringe limit and very distinctive, very biodiverse. Of course, there's 200 years of human settlement. So there's a lot of pressure on the biological diversity that evolved here. And of course, on top of that, we have, until uh, four months ago, we had uh, what we called a dual crisis of global biodiversity loss and global climate change, unprecedented in the history of planet Earth. But on top of that, the last few months, we have another crisis, <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic, the latest in microbial pandemics. So those three crises are the context they apply very much to Southern Canada, to our lives, to the lives of the plants and animals that we share these habitats with. But thank goodness for science. Uh, I was trained as a scientist and with that at the underpinning of the way we know things and how we better inform what we do, we now have what are called nature-based solutions uh, to actually all of these crises. They are highly linked like all good ecological systems. And we know that a significant part of, of ameliorating the effects of rapid climate change and biodiversity loss can happen right here in our daily lives in close proximity to where we work, play and live. We call that growing Canada's biggest wildlife garden. That's a significant part of putting biodiversity back. And as we'll see in this session about planning, how you change what you do and how you can actually benefit in many ways. Um, this is part of that nature-based solutions. In addition, of course, what we're all trying to do to address climate change is to change our carbon footprint on the planet. We're not going to talk about that today. That's a very big deal for World Wildlife Fund and many, many governments. But at the heart of all this and the examples we'll share from this zone that we've worked for four or five years in with this program called In the Zone, we know this, that restoration and protection of these habitats is the best thing to do. And that's what this is all about, one garden at a time. Next slide, Emily. Let me click the next slide. Okay, this program about uh, basically changing what's in your garden, whether it's getting rid of asphalt, concrete, or lawn, or anything else, it isn't really doing anything particularly significant for local wildlife or you. Uh, that's what this is about. And we know that the native species that evolved here, including the very best, most efficient pollinators and some of the most beautiful plants and animals will thrive and respond very quickly when you just get smarter and more progressive about what you put in the garden to look at out your window. Yes, we can, as Mr. Obama says. Next slide. So this program called In the Zone, there's the logo. We developed this jointly with Carolinian Canada, an organization, great organization focused on this zone in Southern Ontario. And it's really a collation of all the knowledge and all the resources that uh, are available to help people do this. And it's really taking off because more and more people are desperate for ways to build a better future for their kids and grandchildren. This slide just illustrates um, some numbers which actually over the four years that we've piloted this there's dramatic um, numbers of that are increasing uh, we have a thing called the tracker which allows us to quantify and track the annual impact uh, right now actually this slides out of date we have over 5,000 gardeners registered with this in the zone program and all it is really is starting with a minimum of one native plant uh, putting it there and people tend to increase the number of those plants. That increases the number of hectares of native plant cover. And these are in total wonderful actions, as we'll see, I think in the next slide, Emily, uh, to improve things, uh, to connect to the green dots, uh, parks and ravines and things, interspersed by uh, concrete and houses and asphalt and lawn, but we can do way better than that. Lawn, of course, supports a very few species compared to all these native species and 
That's what we're doing is establishing ecological connections through the people that actually live in these connected spaces. Next slide. That was the example from uh, Toronto, Hamilton, Golden Horseshoe area, but the map would look very similar if you're in the, the uh, suburbs, uh, the fringes of uh, Calgary, or Halifax, Montreal, or Vancouver. The most amazing thing for me, my kids, neighbors, and everybody who's sampled this program is how quickly these native plants, even in the first year, and certainly by the second year, you introduce them, you follow the steps that we're going to give you in this uh, webinar about the techniques and the how-to, it's not rocket science, but within hours, I am not joking, all kinds of bee and butterfly species in the daytime come to the garden that people have never seen before. I don't know how they find these things. Ben's an expert, he might give you clues, but uh, this is a, an American lady butterfly on some uh, echinacea purple coneflower in my garden. The very first year I put that coneflower in. The speed is amazing and that gives people, young and old, the emotional feedback that drives you to do more of this. You're really making a visible difference. Next slide. So this isn't just for fancy gardens, as I'm sure you'll hear about from Ben, a big old garden. This is about anything from a brand new subdivision right through to rooftops, to curbside, uh, to balconies, to edges of factories. And these are all projects where people have started and rapidly shown what the, the achievements are in terms of these species and how to get them established the way they were before we built the city, basically. Next. Yeah, so this is my most important slide. Contextually here, um, there are numerous co-benefits of having native plants, the ones that are local and native to your area, they're the best adapted to what nature and our planet provides in those areas. And lo and behold, if you take that grass away or at least some of it or the concrete, guess what? The native plants don't need pesticides. They don't need herbicides. They don't need any fertilizers. Uh, once you've got them established in the first year or two, you don't need to water them because they have massively deep roots that they evolved to deal with these Southern Canadian hot, dry, long summers. Very, very little maintenance compared to all these annuals and beds that you get from the regular garden centers currently. And all of that rolls up into actually mid to long term, really significant cost savings. And I have to admit, I get lazier as I get older. So I like the idea of a low maintenance garden that's gonna save me money and I'm not gonna to have to pour chemicals on. Of course, the increases in changing habitat this way are also uh, quite dramatic in terms of shade. If you've got shrubs or, or trees uh, shading your house, big reductions in costs for air conditioning, et cetera soaking up water before it flushes down the street and into the stormwater system is a huge thing a sponge for water in your garden by having deep rooted plants to keep the water there the human well-being ryan's going to tell us some of those examples um, really massive especially now with people having a lot of time on their hands uh, kind of can find more to their home and garden than they've ever been all of this rolls up to increase carbon storage and of course, better resilience for the ecosystem and of course, biodiversity. That's the mission of World Wildlife Fund front and center, but very much with people in the mix. So that's a very dramatic slide. I'd like you all to bear that in mind as you think about how you're gonna sign up and do more of this and tell your neighbors too. Next slide. Okay. My last little section, I get the best bit, which is uh, the first of the six steps in planning your native plant, wildlife and pollinator garden is to stop, sit down, close your eyes and come up with your vision, your dreams and your values. And when I did that 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago, moved into an old house in Toronto downtown. And on the right of that picture is what the yard looked like the back of our house. It was all ashfront. It was six car parking. And by year two, as my daughters started to grow up, we realized that wasn't really 
that good. So over that time, we put the vision in to have green there. We had some Colombian refugee students in, they volunteered in exchange for free accommodation, took it away, and we put in place a vision and values that we wanted and it evolves as the family grows, but that's a snapshot of the diverse things in our backyard with probably over a hundred species of bees and other pollinators now coming in from I don't know where, but it's, it's just a little wildlife oasis. And that's because we had the dream and the vision to get rid of the asphalt and the lawn and put in this kind of diverse habitat with a nice bench for me to sit on. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to hand it over now to Ben, I think. Is that right? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ewens and <laughs> Mr. Godfrey. Great to share the stage with you guys. So we're talking about preparation here, about setting up. And so I'll just go through a few of the points here that you'd wanna consider. You don't have to consider all of these things. You could just start off, but you'll be better suited for success if you take a little bit of time after you've, like Pete says, close your eyes and really <clears throat> vision what you'd love to see there. So the soil types vary across um, our region and, and across Canada, of course, from soils that vary in pH to different levels of nutrients. These are good considerations. Even within the Great Lakes region, we have you know, really old forests. We have places that are wetlands and used to be wetlands. We have prairies, even though we're, we have less than 1% of what we used to have. But big consideration there to really figure out what you have in terms of soil. And then of course, um, plants will vary so much from those that don't mind standing in water for weeks or sometimes months at a time. So um, other plants will die if that's true. So you want to have a little bit of time and kind of um, just be an observer, Obser observer for drainage and water, observe it, observer for lighting as well, because uh, if it's an older neighborhood like mine established in the 1850s, then You'll, you'll realize that you have really different lighting compared to someone in a new subdivision or an area where some of these older trees have to be eventually removed. And then climate, of course, we have so many varied regions across uh, the country and some of those areas in the US where people are listening. Um, existing plants and animal use. Some of the plants might be there that aren't native, but they're beautiful shrubs or they're ones that you're kind of attached to. We're not asking you to take them all out. Just have a consideration for what's there, what you want to keep and what you might be able to replace. And then past and current use. It, it, could, it, be an, it could be an area that was farmed recently and so the soil might be really depleted or it could be something that's been just waiting and has uh, really great nutrients. Um, also municipal bylaws and policies. That's an important thing. And a lot of places are getting a little more lax in terms of native plant gardens. And there's a whole variation of what we have for native plant gardens. Some people just don't cut their lawn and it overgrows and some people don't like the, the look of that. And so, you know, sometimes uh, the municipality is called and you have to mow it. But sometimes this is the case for native plant gardens as well when it's something like a tall grass prairie. So you want to look ahead and kind of check in with your neighbors because we're talking about the planning session. So you don't want to put a lot of effort into something and then have to remove areas. And then of course, as Pete said, your values. Um, I've got over 200 species of native plants, but I still have a lot of lawn left in the backyard because I have kids they wanted to play, we have barbecues, we really like sports. So you'll really wanna keep considering what your options are. And then your connection to other gardens and green spaces. Uh, this would really inform um, you know, what kinds of things you, you wanna put in or maybe collaborate with your neighbors that have started something already and, and share plants with them. Next slide. Okay, this used to be a video. There's a really zoomed in photograph of my face, but really please focus on the background. Uh, this is uh, just yesterday, actually. It's my native plant garden in the front yard. And I actually am looking at the soil here because I touched on this a minute ago. And it's something that a lot of people don't consider. When I started this garden about 14 years ago, 
I put in native trilliums and all sorts of plants and I invested heavily into them and hardly any of them survived. And I was really demoralized. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And over the years, I've come to learn a lot of things about the critical uh, foundation. Of course, it's foundation, it's on the ground, our soils. And most of the diversity in our ecosystems is actually below that surface layer where we have bacteria, fungi, and microorganisms, they're all super critical. And they're critical because they actually enable the plants to feed. And of course, plants will take in uh, sunlight that they, they convert to sugars, but they also need important nutrients and minerals, which they get from the soil. And without their association uh, with the bacteria and the fungi, they actually can't convert all of this amazing energy into food for themselves. So what these eventually do is the, the plant root systems will put off a sticky substance called exudates. And these exudates are actually little sticky carbohydrates and uh, sugars and proteins. The bacteria and the fungi come in and the, the species of bacteria and fungi are actually very specific to the plant itself. So the more diversity of plants we have, the more bacteria we have and, and fungi in the soil. And the bacteria and fungi actually aerate and creates a glue so that the plant can really hold the soil together. So in addition to uh, providing amazing soil for the plants in a certain kind of ecosystem, these bacteria and fungi actually prevent erosion. Uh, they aerate the soil. They do all sorts of things that we take for granted. So a lot of people, when they think about native plant gardens, they're just thinking about the plants, where in actual fact, um, more critical than anything is that soil. And it'll take a while to build it up. And some of the things you can do in the very beginning uh, for planning purposes is that you can find some soil from maybe a neighbors or maybe someone in the country and you can bring some soil that actually has some of the bacteria and the fungi in. You have to do this carefully because you can spread non-native invasive plants so you have to be sure that you're using a very clean shovel and you have permission and you don't take a lot you fill up the hole but there are tricks that you can do in addition to people like me now that my garden is really well established um, I have to so-called weed every year. And I don't call it weed because weed is a term that is just a plant that you really don't want. But when I thin out my native plants and share them with my neighbors or people that will come in from you know, the next town or city over, they're getting some of my soil that has recovered. And in the beginning when those trillions wouldn't survive, now they're reproducing like crazy as are all the other species. So it's super exciting to see how that happens relatively quickly because we've done so many awful things to our soil, largely neglect, uh, but there are ways to build it up and, uh, and really bring back that ecology. Next slide. So looking at some of uh, the little wetland features that we could start with, uh, first off, if you're, you have a building, why not capitalize on the water that's hitting the building? So on the right there, you'll see these rain barrels. Uh, these can be used throughout the season. If you can manage to get a few of them and fill them up when it rains a little more heavily in the spring, you can use it on into the early summer, but certainly sometimes in the summer with thunderstorms, you can capture a lot of water. And why not use that water? Because the truth is, in a lot of our cities and towns, we're actually uh, losing a lot of that water that, that really moves quickly over concrete and asphalt and goes into our systems without even getting absorbed into our system. When we capture at least some of it, we can put it back in our gardens and then it goes in and like Pete says, you know, the whole thing becomes a sponge and we, we keep that water in the system a lot faster than just sending it down the drain. On the left hand side there, you'll see kind of the drawings, the basic overview of a very simple rain garden. Uh, if you've had a minute here to look at this part of the slide, you can see that with very little materials and a, and a few key features, you can create areas where you're losing some of this water anyway, and put in some native plants that don't mind being wet for a while, and have some pollinators and have an incredible site that is actually functioning as a short-term wetland, which is what we call an ephemeral wetland. This will allow us to have many different other species of plants, which in turn will in, in attract different insects, really help the soil. 
And so this is something really worthwhile doing because you can't have rain barrels for every area on your, your property. Next slide. Okay, this is for people who might be interested in going a little bit larger. This is my backyard. It's really dated. Actually, my daughter in the middle there is now 20 years old. So you can see this was back quite a few years. Um, and we are talking about planning here. So another thing to do when you're visioning and dreaming is, is look at your space. We've been really blessed to have a big backyard. It goes back 217 feet. And this spot was consistently wet. Now that's not gonna hold water all year round. So I looked at the site and decided, yeah, I want water all year round. So I had to, to design an area that would have a liner. This was within a couple of months of actually putting everything down. So there are actually a lot more rocks here and it, it's matured. Uh, but the critical thing here is to plan out an area. Um, you, you might want to do a deep water pond like I have in the foreground there. Um, right behind it is a waterfall. Um, I got to thinking, gosh, it'd be really nice to have a trickle. And I don't know if you remember that slide that Pete showed that had two birds in there. Well, that second bird on the right-hand side is actually a black-throated blue warbler that nests up in the boreal forest. When birds hear the sound of water, they will actually stop off during my so that trickle area by that yellow flower in uh, above the kids there, I had 10 of those black-throated blue warblers and it was just remarkable. Uh, so take a, a lot of time to plan if you're going to do a wetland. And I actually can show that there are three different types here. Uh, that deep water cell in the beginning at the top left is a dragonfly cell, which is very shallow without fish. And then uh, where you see a lot of the taller plants, that's actually a biological filter, which um, is all native plants to clean the water. So this whole system actually moves and functions as a little ecosystem. And of course, to plan something like this, you have to take a lot of time and uh, you can do it or you can consult someone to give you some advice. Next slide. Now, some of the things that we uh, start with, like we said a couple of times now, uh, important consideration is lighting. If you, um, you know, have an area like that third slide uh, from the left over and it's shady and you put in, in plants that like sunlight, they'll get really tall and fall over. So, and, and certainly ecosystems like uh, prairies will want more sunlight. So you have to pay attention. You have to know the area. Some plants can go in both for sure and that's a great opportunity. And when you're in older neighborhoods like mine with a bit of space, you may be fortunate to have some partial shade, some sunlight areas, and then some shady spots for having woodlands and forests. Next slide. And another thing when we're starting out, uh, we might not realize because maybe we don't know these plants. And actually, I don't really know too many plants that are in the horticultural industry from other parts of the world. My specialization is native plants, but I quickly learned these plants because these are non-native plants, which we call invasive because they're from other parts of the world. And these particular plants will take over sections the one in the top left there is called periwinkle. It's got a beautiful little flower. I'm sure where it comes from in the world, in Asia, it, it has an important function. And here, it is a really nice ground cover, but it completely takes over. If you put in native plants and you have it nearby, uh, you'll lose them pretty quickly because these plants here, by definition being invasive, they are aggressive. And other plants here like garlic mustard and gout weed, English ivy, you'll recognize these plants pretty quickly. And sometimes it takes quite a bit of effort to get them out of your garden. If you can contain them and have one area of periwinkle because you like it, go ahead. Uh, but you'll find a lot of native plant alternatives and you might wanna take some time to do some of that research to find things like running strawberry and all sorts of other options that we have that have a similar function but aren't quite as aggressive. Next slide. So um, to help you start off and get going, once you've considered all of these things, uh, together World Wildlife Fund and Carolinian Canada put together these beginning guides, which kind of feature the different types of gardens that you can have. So when you sign up for 
in the zonegardens.ca and uh, start to register your garden through the tracker, you can download these guides and see where you want to start. It gives you ideas about no, uh, local native plant nurseries, a list of plants in your region, and certainly useful tips and important links. Okay, I think the next slide and I might be passing it over to Ryan. That's me. All right. Thanks very much, Ben. I love how you talk about exude dates. Who doesn't love a good exude date? Jeez. Um, all right. So I'm here to have us think about the bigger picture. So we have a very natural tendency when we're planning our garden to zoom right into a particular spot. And of course, those details are incredibly important in making your garden thrive. But I want to tell you that from time to time, it's important to zoom out because, of course, ecology does not have boundaries. So your garden is really much bigger than your actual garden. It extends very, very far beyond that. Next slide, please. Okay, so for example, here is um, a road in um, Ronces Vale's neighborhood here in Toronto. And you can see there's a, a connection of front yard gardens here at the side of the road and no one garden is really separated from any other one from the perspective of a bird or a butterfly or a bee it's just one continuous habitat broken up by a little bit of asphalt or pavement but really when you're thinking about your garden it's so important to consider what's next door to you are there other properties are there parks are there natural areas and maybe you know consider how your particular garden spot is um, situated and how it can be connected to that surrounding geography. Of course, trees form almost a continuous canopy in um, some parts of downtown Toronto. Um, and that's an important thing to note as well. You'll also have to consider how people are going to see it. So I've, I've already seen in the comments, some people have talked about their neighbors and people walking past. They're all part of your local ecology too, like it or not. So consider how other people are going to use and, and maybe even impact your garden space too. Next slide, please. Okay, here is one of my absolute favorite examples of a connecting garden. This again is right downtown, and I mean really right downtown in Toronto, next to one of actually our, our biggest tourist attractions, which is just north of this, the, the far end of this photo is Graffiti Alley. And so many people I notice walking down Graffiti Alley and they completely miss the Alex Wilson Community Garden, which is this, um, this space pictured here. And what I love about it is that on the west side of the garden, west of the boardwalk, is a native plant garden, well established. It's been going for uh, well over a decade now. And on the east side of the boardwalk is a community garden where people grow vegetables and herbs and all kinds of other plants that are of interest to them. And to me, native plants and community gardens, they go together like peas in a pod. Um, they just are so, so perfectly well um, together. And of course, again, pollinators and bees and whatnot, they don't know the difference. In fact, in this particular spot just last year, I saw a giant swallowtail butterfly for the first time in my whole life, which was amazing. And it chose to land of all places on a tomato plant. I don't know why, but that's what it preferred to do. And that's where I was able to snap a photograph, which I felt very lucky about. Next slide, please. So consider just how you're going to be using your space too. Because of course, when we're doing um, native plant gardening, we do have a focus on wildlife and nature, but it's, it's also a garden for you. It's for people too. It's a space for both of us. So consider at different times of year, are you going to want to sit maybe on a bench and reflect and read and meditate? Um, how are you going to, to spend your time in this space? And, and in so doing, you know, improve your, your well-being and mental health. We know that this is one of the ecosystem services that's brought to us by a natural space or a garden. And how are you going to maximize that for yourself and anyone else who's going to be using your garden too? Next slide, please. So in zooming out, you can think of 
the physical connections of your garden, but then there's also the time axis. How is your garden going to change over time? It's really important to remember that native plant gardens change shape throughout the year. They're constantly evolving. So here is one garden pictured in all four seasons of the year, and you can see how it's dramatically changing. And you want to make sure that you have something of interest for you and for wildlife um, during really every month of the year, if possible, because these, these gardens never stop. Um, and of course, not only from season to season, but also from year to year, your garden will change through a process of ecological succession. That's something that you can consider as well. Next slide, please. So back to the seasonal sort of flow, um, I helped develop a guide that we called the Four Seasons of Wildlife Gardening, which really revolved around this wheel diagram because we recognize that, of course, seasons are cyclical and uh, you can start a garden really at any time of year if, and, and continue through this wheel and you just keep going and going and going. And we'll, we'll get more into the specific details of each of these seasonal maintenance activities in the fourth part of our series. But um, for now, you know, we're in spring, so consider we should be thinking about planting, should be thinking about minimal, minimal fertilizing using solid fertilizer and weeding. These are the things that we focus on in this guide. And I just wanted to focus on one more word here, which may be new to some of you, which is solarization, which you can start in early summer. So next slide, please. And this is what we're talking about here, solarization. Um, is one of the things we included in planning because it's something that you need to start thinking about a little bit early. It takes a little bit of time to get going, but it's a great way to convert a lawn or a weedy patch um, into basically a fresh new garden bed. And there's lots of different ways of doing it. Pictured here, you see some plastic sheets or tarps weighed down by rocks or bricks. You can also do the lasagna approach, um, taking layers of cardboard um, or newspapers and that works really well. Basically the reason we put this in the summer and it's best to do this in a sunny spot is that the sun's heat will bake the vegetation underneath including the weedy seed bank or any of that turf grass and after about six weeks or so you can depending on the conditions of course you can peel back your solarization layer and you'll find that you have a sterile uh, blank slate canvas to work with. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll be passing it back to Pete. Okay, thank you all. Given time, I'll race through here, but uh, as I think Emily mentioned at the beginning, put your questions in the um, chat and Q&A room here. And at the end, I think we have a, quite a bit of time. We'll be happy to do our best to answer them and also follow up later, of course. Anyway, having done all of that, that um, and more that um, Brian and Ben mentioned, um, it's time to consider the pros and cons and how far you can go and your timing and everything to assess your options and come up with your plan. So next slide, Emily. So basically, there's a list of things to consider. I won't run through all these. Uh, many have been touched on, but really th this is a somewhat uh, structured, subjective uh, step in the process. You just have to consider carefully. With your immediate uh, family and neighbors too, if you can, and then look at you know a few costs up front if you haven't got the tools look at the savings and uh, move on to produce your plan which is the next slide so once you've done all that sketch it out uh, take any drawings that do exist um, put it onto paper redo it draft it and the picture there's just a reminder to me that uh, so, so often happens people forget to factor in the size of the plants and so you put the big plants at the back and the small plants at the front and uh, as you select the species that's an important one so you don't have to move them through time but producing that map that's your guide if you feel comfortable about that have it before you start and then it's time to get started next slide so along the way um, 
I'm just going to quickly summarize. Of course, you're going to pick up a lot of information. Thank you. Uh, a lot of this for this Ontario zone has been collated, as I said, through the inthezonegardens.ca website. You can find a lot of this. The full plant lists of all the local species that are best for pollinators and that will thrive the best here and make the biggest difference. Uh, a full list of the best local nurseries that grow these local source native plants. That's very key. You'll also see uh, in some of those uh, now a little tag in the bottom left there. Um, there was no certification system in place such as exists now for uh, timber and FSC um, certified lumber. But these tags are where ethically sourced, locally grown, local native species are what's in the pot when you go to these specialist nurseries. And I'm very glad to say that uh, Loblaw uh, this next month actually in 35 of their stores in southern Ontario are going to become the very first Canadian garden center retail outlet among the big four to provide a significant option of thousands of local sourced native plants for people to purchase rather than their annuals and all their fertilizers and pesticides and all the petunias and everything that look nice but really are contributing nothing for uh, biodiversity and all those other benefits to be looked at. Another thing that means a lot in Toronto is actually <laughs> being able to keep your plants when they're small or the seeds when they're outside alive without the birds and the squirrels and the raccoons digging them up. Even opossums love to dig them up. So that's what the, the, the wire mesh is and uh, you can find that on people's curbsides quite often. And this fabulous book, um, 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants, Lorraine Johnston, who will appear on some of our later webinars, is really a uh, North American uh, guru on this. That provides from coast to coast a range of species to consider as you're planning your garden. Collate all of that information. Uh, next slide, Emily. And put together really a small amount of gear that you need. You can borrow it. There are tool uh, libraries, lending. It's not expensive. Uh, people can give you some of these things for Christmas. That's it for my entire 20 years of gardening in West Toronto. Next slide. And keep records. That is something I wish I'd done properly at the beginning. I expect Ben's the same. Uh, I'm an old fashioned pencil and notebook guy. Here it is. I've still got my eraser on the end. And you can transfer that to the computer, of course, and you will really be grateful that you took those notes at the beginning, before, during, and after. And then keep monitoring uh, how it goes. And in the um, fifth of this series, we're focusing very much on monitoring and citizen science, because that is such an important thing these days that contributes not just to your information base, but broader regional, national and global uh, citizen based information, which uh, is now used in big peer reviewed science papers to look at trends in wildlife and habitat cover and other important things. We can all help in very meaningful ways here. Next slide, Emily. So I think that's the end of the, the key steps. I, I'm indulging here because, uh, partly because we all uh, have a lot of feeling now for what's happening in seniors' residences. And this, only a year and a bit ago, um, was one such West Toronto nursing home where one of the residents said, I'm so sad that there's nothing colorful out the window on the ground floor they sit and have their meals and everything they spend their lives in there and uh we said well you know uh we could we could help we're looking for a prototype garden for pollinators and other wildlife and with the community help um in really just one season there by september last year these seniors were sitting there behind the window eating breakfast lunch and dinner watching butterflies and bees and some birds and a beautiful array of totally native plant colorful uh, blooms. And that's it. I mean, it's actually an emotional positive feedback loop. And that's what can happen in people's balconies or individual homes. But it means a lot to know that these seniors are going to be looking at that very shortly now, again, this spring. 
Next slide. And that's just in my garden. I can't believe that these animals come and my little iPhone can take these kind of pictures. <laughs> I don't know what all these species are. I naturalist and other identification apps are remarkable for someone my age. I just can't believe that in seconds you can find out the Latin name of this critter that you've never seen before. But that's it, all from my little backyard. Okay, next slide. So in summary, there it is. Six steps. I'm sure some of you will just love this and uh, know it well. But for those of you who have yet to get started, my goodness, uh, this is such a rich thing to do. And particularly this spring where people are yearning for things to do. I hear that vegetable seeds are sold out. Well, I think some of these native plant seedlings are going to be selling out pretty quickly too. Next slide. We won't itemize these, but these are the kind of books, reports, and key resources that you can find, not only on the In The Zone website. Um, the, these ones, although that's focused on Ontario, some of the uh, questions I can see in the chat room say, well, does this relate to my region? Most definitely, some of these things relate to the entire continent. They're fantastic uh, books available, of course, um, at libraries and uh, well worth go into a bookstore when they reopen. Next slide. The, what we're doing is trying to pull together here too um, the resources that are available to make it easier for you and your neighbors who want to get started and don't really know where to look. And that's what it is, a whole series of great websites. This recording will be online so you can refer back to this slide. So don't bother trying to jot down all these uh, web links while I speak. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to hand it back to Emily. I think we've finished in good time and I'll just say my thank you and we're here to try to answer your great questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Pete. And thank you to Ryan and Ben as well for giving everybody that awesome introduction and how to plan your native plant garden. Um, as we said, we're going to be trying to get through as many of the chat questions as we can. And if we're not able to reach out to you, you can email us directly um, with the email addresses here on the screen. And we'll also um, you know, try to reach out to you personally by email after this if you haven't been able to um, get to your questions. And as Pete mentioned, if you are living in Southern Ontario, in the Carolinian zone, you can visit inthezonegardens.ca and that's a great place um, where you can register your garden with us and um, we can start tracking how much habitat we're restoring in the region. Okay, so let me just go through these questions. As Pete mentioned, one of the big ones that's come up is um, what if you don't live in the Carolinian zone? So some of those resources that Pete pointed out are a really good place to start. Um, and Pete, do you have anything else to add about what people can do if they're not living in the Carolinian zone? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I'll invite Ryan and Ben to chime in too, but the North American Native Plant Society is fantastic. Ben, uh, Ryan is a board member of it, but uh, it's a completely voluntary group. Um, heavily centered in Canada, but it's North America wide. It's got a lot of great stuff on its, um, its um, website about this. Also the Pollinator Partnership, um, PP, uh, which we, we're working with their Canadian um, chapter here, but they have fairly recently, I think last year, Ryan, they produced a wonderful regional guide series cover all essentially the eco, big eco zones in North America and talking about this same stuff. They've pulled it all together. So Brian, you and Ben chime in with other suggestions. Yeah, thanks Pete. Those are really great places to start. And the only thing that I would add is that for many of you just starting to embark on this journey, the very most important first step is gonna be connecting with a local native plant nursery that specializes in locally sourced and ethically propagated native plants. And again, I would direct you towards that um, North American Native Plant Society website where they have a list of um, such um, specialized nurseries all across um, North America. And hopefully you can find one near you and connect with them. 
Yeah, and I would just add that um, hundreds of hours and so many people went into creating in the zone gardens .ca, and it's a really great model. Um, for sure, those suggestions are great. If you have somebody or, or find out of somebody in the neighborhood like me, for example, I will have a, a day or two each year where I do uh, go through and thin my garden and I'm happy to share plants and I, I can't, you know, if you're in Alberta or Michigan, but um, certainly look for local people that um, can kind of be mentors when you're starting out because uh, some people learn really well from others directly. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we have a question from Janet. She wants to know the best way to propagate blood root plant and the best time of year to do that. Um, I think that's a Ben question. <laughs> is it a Ben question? Mm. Well, I don't know. We probably could all propagate it, but this, this plant is so close to my heart because it's, it's such a great example of, you know, once you have it established, the ants take over. Um, they actually farm this plant and forest ecosystems, and they'll do that in your gardens. Uh, I don't know if we have the time now, but first of all, I should say uh, you, you can transplant it in the fall if you know where it was growing and it was from a garden like mine or someone else's. You have permission. Um, the seeds also readily will, um, will just put them in the leaf litter and they often germinate. But the best way, if you have a, an area, is to really let the ants do it. It's amazing. They pull the the seeds into their colony, they actually pull off a fleshy part that's high in lip lipids and fatty acids and proteins, and they feed their young. And then the ants will take the leftover seeds and put them in the best places to grow. So, you know, we can't do it better than nature, but remember we are nature. So just observe and follow and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll happen itself. But if you want to do it a little more directly, you can do it straight by the seeds or you can transplant the entire plant either early in the spring or, you know, kind of mid fall. So there's a thing called division. Is that okay for blood root too? Cause the leaves die back pretty soon, Ben. I mean, can you take like a quarter of it, divide it and move it to somewhere else? Yeah, you can, you can, and you'll actually see where it gets its name from because it will actually start to bleed red um, from the roots and from the stems as well. And um, it will repair itself fairly quickly. And, uh, you know, but one of the joys that I have this time of year is to see what the ants have done. And I go out there and I see all the tiny white flowers with yellow centers. And it's like, this is where the ants decided to take it. And then I can carefully move these young plants. Um, don't do it when it's flowering, wait until afterwards in the fall. Uh, but you'll also see um, from the base of the clump of where the mature group has grown that sometimes when those seeds fall, you'll see tiny little seedlings and you can move those this time of the year, but don't take away the parts that are flowering. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and we have a question from Karen. She wants to know how to identify the type of soil that you have um, such as the pH and the nutrients. Hmm. Ben, I feel like you want to take this one. I, I can maybe talk about it too. I mean, the, you have to dig. The first thing you have to do is dig <laughs> and start getting in the soil. So I did this as an um, environmental consultant for three years. A lot of digging and rolling, and you can figure out sort of the clay content um, and whatnot that way there's uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to Ben. He's really the soil guy. There it goes. It wasn't unmuting. Um, yeah, well, the best thing is you can get little tiny kits or you can take it in somewhere, but that's a lot of effort um, to do. Uh, but I, you know, it, usually you'll see a range of plants that are, are growing to begin with in a, a natural area nearby. And you can look to see what, what types of pH they, they like. That's an easy way to do, kind of mimic what nature has. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, you, well, that's what I would say. That's the number one thing to do is see what's growing in the surrounding natural area and check in on the pH of those plants. Now for the uninitiated, I could perhaps share the story of that senior's home where we didn't do any of that systematic stuff. We just took by hand, took the turf up and the soil was complete rubbish. It obviously been brought in from some low grade industrial site and dumped there. It had old nails and buckets and things in it. It was awful. Um, but we planted 
a range of, we sowed a, a range of seeds and in the spring we put a range of native plants in and some of them didn't like that particular kind of soil, but the rest of them did. And that bracketing, as I call it, really worked great. So even if you, you know, don't want to go and put money in or time and effort and all this soil pH and master gardener type stuff, you know, you just plant a selection of things. And as Lorraine Johnson often says, you know, sometimes we just don't know. The plants make their own mind up. Mm -hmm. And that garden, the visual and the contribution to general pollinators and wildlife is so obvious. And you just accept that, you know, a third of the species and plants that you put in didn't like it there. Okay. So, you know, I think that's a good bit of advice for the, the non-expert gardener. Yeah. And then I would just add to that, that certain plants um, that are native in certain years just thrive. Uh, because they like the soil, they like the moisture conditions, they like the weather. Next year, it could be the same year, but it doesn't happen. So you, you have to get used to sort of reading the seasons, knowing that the plants are going to be responding to cues that we don't even know about, and we probably won't, won't ever know. So there is a lot of experimentation and kind of letting go to know that it's going to do some of these things on its own. And, and you won't know why, but maybe you'll see why. And it's often, you know, a surprise like a butterfly that hasn't shown up in a long time or some spectacular moth or, or some other indication. Great. And we have a question from Tina who is asking Ryan, if she only has a balcony garden, um, is she still able to feel connected even with just pots and plants on her balcony? Well, <laughs> I have to say yes to that. And of course, I've seen a few questions about container gardening with native plants in the Q&A, which is fantastic. And the answer is yes, absolutely. My little urban oasis, my hanging gardens of Toronto is um, just out the, the door here on my balcony. And um, we're dedicating an entire episode of this series to that. It's going to be the third one in the series. So please join us for that and you'll learn a lot more about container gardening. But if I can just ask you, Ryan, I mean, I've only once been there to your balcony, but you, you've told me that some afternoons you have four or five different species of bees and you're on the sixth floor. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I do. It's a, it's a, a legitimate ecology I have up here. It's Amazing. A, a cliff ecology is what I call it. Um, but I do get I get, I had a red-tailed hawk visit me one time while I was sitting out there. Um, I do get all different species of bees and wasps and flies and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's, it really does count as an ecological space in my mind. Ben, you've got something to add. Well, I don't know. Is there another question queued? Because I just saw somebody sent a question and it really excited me. This is the leaves one? Yes. Yes, you, go for go it. Go on. I was right. going to ask. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is from Kate, um, all of us, that uh, it says, from what date can you rake leaves without killing butterfly and other insect larvae? And um, I, don't, I don't think we know for everything, uh, but for certainly some things like fireflies, which are actually, um, they're not flies, they're beetles, and certainly um, some moth larvae. Like there are some moths, for example, that are the size of our hands. So when you hold up your hand, um, and it's outright. These are the silkworm moths, the giant moths. They're spectacular. They're beautiful. As an adult form, they only live for one to three days. And if you see them, your, your heart kind of drops. It's, it's so much beauty and to know that they're just there without even mouth parts. They're just, they come out of the, the cocoon or the pupa to um, turn into the beautiful adult. And then they live for just uh, one or two or three days to, to breed and lay their eggs and die. And those pupa, if you rake the leaves, you won't even know they're in there. If you rake them and pile them and send them off, you'll kill them until, you know, essentially um, a lot of them come out mid-June to late June, early July in this part of the continent. Um, so for some species we know, for some we don't. So if you want an area certainly where you can mow and, um, you know, certainly do that. But make sure you have a good section where you have some of those leaves down for the entire season if you can. And that's, you know, call that your native plant garden section so that at least you can preserve some of these species. And then naturally the leaves are 
the part of the nutrient cycle that the, the yep. worms and beetles and microbes take it down. That's just the best type. That's really natural composting fertilization, right? Right, exactly, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, I just wanted to let people know, although we are over time, we're going to stay on the line and continue to answer questions for about probably 10 or 15 more minutes. But if you do have to drop off of the webinar, I just want to remind you all that we have five more webinars coming up in the next month. The next one is called Digging In, and it's going to show you how to put this plan into action. And you can register for those at www.ca. Um, the link will be right on our homepage. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And if you're able to stay on the line, that's great. And um, we'll continue answering your questions. Thanks for anybody who has to go. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you, to yeah. see you in following, following I'm, this. I'm, I'm curious, actually, for my colleagues. I mean, I'll kick off. Philip B. has asked, will solarization reduce or eliminate established poison ivy plants? And I'm a big fan of solarization for sure. When it's done properly, it really bakes the top four or five inches of soil. And for the whole summer in a sunny area, that, will, that oven really that you've created through black body absorption will leave you in great stead come September to just put your plants in and there won't be a competition. But I'm assuming uh, that if poison ivy were there, it will have even in the roots in the seed bank have been um, killed. Is that the way you think it would work too, Ryan and Ben? I go ahead, Ryan. Well, first of all, I just wanted to tell people that um, don't forget poison ivy is actually a native plant species. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that it still is all about the right plant for the right place. And of course, if you're in small quarters, it makes I'm never going to encourage someone to plant poison ivy, but just be aware that it is a native plant, which means that it does have deep coevolutionary evolutionary relationships with local uh, biodiversity. That's just a thing. So yeah. if you can, if you can leave it, if it's not bothering anyone, then then do. Um, otherwise, um, I personally don't have experience trying to solarize it, but I suspect that yeah, that rhizomatous growth is always going to get you because where's the end of it? you're going to have to go on and on and on and on to find um, where the plant originates. So it could be challenging, I think. Yeah. And I think Ryan's right. And maybe we're both crazy, but I also think, you know, it's a native plant. You should see the colors it turns in the fall, oranges, uh, reds, beautiful. And I, I get uh, boils on top of boils when I even look at poison ivy. It's <laughs> That's the main reason why I, I don't keep it. But uh, one thing I learned years ago, actually, is that rabbits love to feed on poison ivy. And uh, every 11 to 15 years, um, it will grow up enough, enough toxicity to kill off a lot of rabbits. And so some studies have looked at um, predator prey relationships with foxes and coyotes and rabbits, thinking that was the, the number one indicator of maintaining populations of these, um, these rodents. But actually, it is poison ivy for the most part across the continent. And so I, I keep things around like st stinging nettle in my garden. If you have, uh, like me, uh, at this age, I've actually got arthritis in my thumb joints, and you can take stinging nettle and intentionally put it on your joints and it's very soothing for it. So some of these things and further about that plant is that it's actually the, the food source, the host plant for the um, red admiral. Red admiral. Thank you so much. Beautiful butterfly, red admiral. So these associations, we learn more and more as we start to toy with more and more of these plants, but um, don't take one off the list until you learn a lot and know how it might interact with you, your garden and your neighbors, because that's a consideration. I'll, I'll just add at the end, the, if I'm right, Philip has a garden a bit like mine where neither you nor your neighbors would really want to be working in soil where there's some poison ivy. So if it was me, I know how I get rid of it. I try the solarization thing. And at the edge of the area that I solarized in the fall, what I would do, even if it was there in my neighbors or the ravine and it might come back in, what I do is I, I get old, you know, 10 or 14 inch bathroom tiles and I put a little wall around a barrier to stop any creepy plants coming in. And I suspect uh, that would stop 
any future poison ivy from coming in. Then I'd be free to work in the area in my garden that I wanted to manage the plants for without yeah. the fear of a rash. Yeah, and don't burn it. It, it, will, it can get into your lungs. Um, you know, I've learned so much in the past from not knowing, and even before um, it leaves out, you can get it badly from the roots if you're, you're yeah. bare hand in the roots. Okay, and we have some questions too about eliminating other plants. Um, what can you plant to slow down ragweed um, or to crowd out wild strawberry? Crowd out wild strawberry, excuse me? <laughs> wild strawberry has got to be one of my favorite native plants of all time. So please leave, leave it, let it, or, or let your neighbors dig it maybe, up. Give it to me, I'll take it. <laughs> maybe it's too thick, Ryan. Maybe they have like 10 acres Holy of Holy jeez, I, I want that. Please give it to me. I'm trying hard to establish it here. Um, um, okay, so what I want to say about invasive plants, this is my sort of PSA about invasive plants. I hear people say this all the time, what can I plant to outcompete the invasive plants? And um, I don't know that that is going to be a viable solution, um, unfortunately. And I know it's, it's hard to hear that, um, but ecology does not seem to really be working that way. To me, I just want to put it out there. This is my personal opinion. I feel that Invasive plants are a symptom of an ecology that isn't healthy. We don't have that biodiversity. We've lost it because of degradation and, and destruction and neglect. And really the best way, the best thing that you can do to prevent invasive species from continuing to invade is one, don't plant the next invasive plant, please, so stick to native species. And then two, do everything that you can to bolster the health of our our ecosystems and our biodiversity by doing all of the things that we've described today and will be continuing to describe in the rest of our webinar series. Okay, great. And this is a question for Pete. When keeping records of your garden, is there anything specific people should be looking for? And should they be noting changes day to day, week to week, month mm -hmm. to month? Um, how would you recommend going about that? Well, other than making sure on your plan that you've actually kept a record spatially of what you planted where and put a little label in because you'll forget pretty quickly and those plants move and so year by year it's uh, kind of helpful to wait till it grows up and you can identify what it is oh it's spread on its own or it's seeded in and put that on your map and you know what's where so that's the spatial species id record for the plants the other aspect of the plants is really interesting, and this is part of plant citizen science, is that you can determine the date of first flowering. Ryan's probably got more experience in this, but that um, is a North American program now through iNaturalist and other um, schemes like that, where people sort of type in the picture and the date at the first flowering, and that's changing as the climate warms. And so the earlier flowering and all those records really are helping people understand the rate of climate change and warming. Of course, the biggest, most exciting part for me of what you can record is the insects, uh, small and animals larger that come once you have a decent connected corridor. And I'm, I just can't wait to get home from work, even though I have the best job in the world. Go see, see what's landed in my garden this afternoon in June right through to September. It's, and then I, I point the phone at it and I've got the Seek or the um, whatever the other ID apps are, and it's just great. Then I write that down, keep a record. So I now, I now have 10 species of mammals that I've recorded on my little garden here in West Toronto. Okay, That's great. And we have a question about seeds. Is it a good idea to harvest your own wild plant seeds? Ben, Ben, yeah, take it. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll start because I sure we have all something to add to this. Um, you know, if, if it's a, a natural area that's owned by somebody, um, you really need to check in with them. And even some that are public or owned by the Nature Conservancy for sure, because they have their own seed collecting programs and they don't want to take too much, of course, because they want certain plants to reseed themselves. But if you connect in with a local chapter of maybe the ones Ryan's involved with, with uh, North American 
native plant society or with your local naturalist club, uh, you can go on some outings that are organized. Uh, certainly once you get them established in your own garden, you can start to play with it a little bit. One of my favorite seeds in the section of my garden that's for prairie is called um, gray-headed coneflower. It's actually a brown flower. It looks like black-eyed Susan, brown-eyed Susan, but it's actually taller and it's got its pet, uh, flower petals hang down. It's just gorgeous. And the seeds, when you collect them, they smell so good. You can get a handful with not too much of an area. Uh, but I was heading out there to collect them this past October. And there were uh, only about five or 10 plants together, but a lot of flowering heads. And there were 10 um, American goldfinches on there feeding on the seeds. And I just kind of paused. They kind of looked at me, I slowly retreated. And then I watched for a week or two and they ate all of the seeds. And this is gonna happen all over Southern Ontario. And actually a lot of people will say, you know, there's some debate about feeding the birds, certainly in the city, it's helpful. Um, but a lot of the prairies and the seed heads that we used to have established when we had more habitat, those fed the birds all winter long. And so we've essentially, with, with feeding the birds and bird feeders, we, we're replacing a lot of those, those seeds that are in the wild. So it's certainly very small amounts, um, but if it's anything more than that, um, you know, seek um, permission. Anything to add, guys? No, that sounds about right to me. Yeah, if it's, if it's public land, you really need permits. You need permits to do that. If it's private land, you need um, permission from the landowner. And then just to say though, why I did have a little stint as a seed collector for the uh, the Seeds of Success program for the Millennium Seed Bank pro project in um, the United States. And the, the standard there was once we, even once we had our permits, um, it was never more than 10% of the seeds on a given plant, never more than 10% of the, of the plants in a population. And then we always took three big steps before between collecting from one plant and collecting another. And that's just for the, all the reasons that Ben mentioned so that we would be leaving lots um, for the wildlife and for the recovery and, and perpetuation of that wild population. Okay, great. And our next question is from Lucy. She wants to know the best, AKA the fastest way to create a garden space in the middle of a front lawn that is all grass and whether solarization is um, the right way to go about that. I think that's a Pete question. It's a sunny area. Um, so in the question, it says that um, it's still cool yet and the sun is not making a daily appearance. I see, right. So that's really the very first question when we were at Canada Blooms and thousands of people came to our stand. First one, because that changes so much what your advice. If it's a shady area with less than five or four hours of sun a day, then those species that you pick are going to do well there. Take your grass away, put some of that lawn edging around the area to stop the grass creeping back in or my bathroom tiles, bang them in. And uh, you can get started as I described at the nursing home. I mean, but you gotta be putting in the range of partial shade or shade loving species. Because if you put in, you know, vegetables, tomatoes or um, native plants that thrive in the sun, they're not gonna produce very many flowers and you're not gonna see that many pollinators. What you'll see, what will do best probably is uh, ephemerals, the early spring ephemerals like the blood roots and wild columbine and sedges and things that are flowering around now because they do their thing for the early insects and uh, they generally finish their um, flowering before the droughts come in the summer. Awesome. But Thank it's all you. good. It's all hundreds of times better for biomass of insects and diversity of insects than basic grass or alien tree and shrub species. Awesome. And we have a question about the best type of ground cover to put under a coniferous tree. Okay, there's the woodland, Ben. Yeah, um, so I, I've had to toy with this. I'm sure a lot of people out there have a legacy of someone having planted a spruce tree like white spruce, which is native to Ontario and it's not really native in southern Ontario, but it's planted pretty extensively. And that becomes a pretty difficult place because it gets really dry. Uh, the roots of the spruce tree will suck up the water and it's also shady. 
um, what I've found, um, if you can prune through some of those branches in the spruce and not make it look um, so, um, so bald and unnatural, uh, then uh, you'll get a little bit of light down there. And one plant that I absolutely love, and I was really fortunate one year to do a traditional medicinal plant inventory with uh, some native elders at Anjanon First Nation. And a lot of the elders brought in um, some of their most valued plants for uh, plant, native plant medicines. And one of them, the top one was a, a plant called partridge berry. It's, it's, um, it's actually a deciduous, tiny little shrub. And it has um, waxy little green leaves that are out all year long. And it gets beautiful, tiny little red flowers and red berries. And uh, you have to be a little patient because it takes a while to expand. But wow, does it look beautiful. And when it starts to get happy, it's lush. And um, you can eat those berries. It's, it's just a beautiful plant. So for me, um, and then also along with that um, is wintergreen. It's another one that doesn't get as thick, but it can go hand in hand together. And it's another one that, that stays um, green throughout the, the winter, as the name would suggest. Do you guys have any other plants to suggest? Um, another one that I see growing in coniferous woods is um, starflower. Um, but I wouldn't say that's necessarily a ground cover. It is a low plant, but a beautiful one anyway. Maybe you could sprinkle that one in with some of the others that Ben mentioned. I certainly uh, found that to be one of the most challenging because the, the selection of species that will thrive there is very limited. And But some things are possible. So you just need to go to ask the right nursery and they'll tell you for your local area what, what's best. But also, okay, so one other thought that I just had is consider what a coniferous forest looks like in the wild. I've walked through many, many, many of them and a lot of them have pretty bare soil. It's a lot of needles and there aren't a whole lot, you know, there might be a smattering of wild geraniums or or something like that but yeah. it's it's kind of okay you don't have to cover every square inch of soil with plants um some bare soil is also habitat for certain kinds of ground nesting bees etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, it's yeah. okay to have bare patches don't be afraid of them i think what what some of the cases are though is that this is their entire area so they don't yeah. have a lot to work with and I have noticed also that running strawberry which uh, is actually another tiny little shrub that stays close to the ground it gets beautiful tiny little peach flowers and uh, then they turn into like just spe spectacular fruits it can get fairly dense and I've had some success with it under my white spruce in my front yard Awesome. And we've had a couple of questions come in about what is the best thing to do if you have a hard clay soil or a, a piece of your yard that is um, prone to flooding? This can be challenging. Yeah. I mean, I for those kind of situations, I've come across people who say, I just gave up. And then someone told me I should do a raised bed in a container and, and control the soil and that if, if you want things that need rich soils rather than trying to work the clay just create a, a suitable raised bed i mean ryan's our expert mm -hmm. and you can do that over the top of the clay if you want of course there are species that are adapted to clay mm -hmm. soils too yeah. Yep. Yep. That's, I, I, a container would be one way to go. I would again just mention the same thing that Ben mentioned before. If you've got clay soils where you are, then probably wherever your closest natural area is also has clay soils. Maybe you can find some native plants growing there. Um, and then if you've got a, a an area where water is pooling, to me that feels like the obvious place to do a little bit of digging and do a water garden, of yeah. course. Um, in which case you'll be you'll be adding a little bit of fluffier soil in there and that will increase um, the number of plants that will be available to thrive in that area. Yeah and um, w another trick to add there is that you know some plants might need a little more water than what this is you're talking about so it gets flooded and it's a challenge at certain times of the years year this is where I've actually put in tiny little containers so 
uh, you know, for a while we had bought these acrylic um, drinking cups, uh, glasses from Costco, and they, they all shattered on the outside, but they still held water. And my wife didn't want to keep them, and I couldn't bear myself to throw them out. You know, they were about 20, 25 centimeters tall. So I sunk them in the ground, and I put in things like cardinal flower and other wetland plants, and I put them even in a dry area. And occasionally when I would water my garden, I would fill up the cup and it would hold water sometimes for a week or two. And so some of these wetland plants would survive there. So there are a few little tricks you can do like that. I mean, those cups would have been in the landfill somewhere because they're not recyclable, not a great thing to purchase in the beginning. Uh, so, you know, if you have the choice, don't do that. But in the end, when I looked and realized they weren't recyclable, I am reusing them. And these plants are still coming up every year in these little containers. Hey, thank you so much, Ben. I have one last question before we wrap things up. And this one's for Pete. Um, it would be, how would you go about planting a garden that is good for pollinators, but also allows you to grow vegetables um, that your family can eat? Right. Yeah, well, that's highly topical. <laughs> Just now, I, I heard that you can't buy vegetable seeds in stores. So the, the best thing in my experience is to plan your garden for both. It's not an either or, because both are part of priority values, really, because the food plants that people love the most do actually need pollinators so you eat your zucchini and your tomatoes etc but you need to have efficient bees and other pollinators so you can actually provide some areas for these native plants that are the best for wildlife and biodiversity and all the other things we've been talking about but then in another part of the garden just within flight distance you can actually have the plants that you want to harvest and eat and you know I, that's what I do and some of my neighbors do and Lorraine Johnson will talk about edible native plants in webinar number six with Ryan but those are special plants the majority and the value that most regular Canadians living in urban areas have is the garden is where you can grow more and more vegetables right and some of those uh, vegetable food plants the parsley's and carrots and others are actually um, food plants for caterpillars of some spectacular swallowtail uh, butterfly species black swallowtail and others i probably don't know about yet but it's that mix um that you know basket of options and you know you produce a diversity not just kentucky bluegrass everywhere in your lawn, which really is good for virtually nothing. Um, just a diversity of habitat types within your small garden is good. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, and just wanna to touch on one more thing that I've seen is a pretty common question that's come in, is about which Lawball locations are gonna have these native plants. Um, that's something that we'll be putting on the In The Zone Gardens website next week. Um, and that's something we can also email that information out with the recording of this webinar to everybody who attended um, later next week. So I just want to thank everybody for tuning in and especially everyone here who stayed on with us over time today. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm for native plant gardening. Um, please join us again on Saturday um, to find out how you can get started, actually dig your hands into the ground. And we will see you again Saturday then, hopefully for the rest of the webinars. And just remember, um, we can help wildlife thrive um, by planting native gardens. So thank you so much, everybody. Namaste. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you.